This is the 966 episode 72. Mr. Richard Wilson. Hello. Hey, hey Mr. Lucian Big. How Hello. are you? I let, you know, I start all these shows laughing because we've been chatting about stuff. Yeah, we're just hitting, we just we arbitrarily hit record <laughs> and just start talking. You go into yours and we, we just been talking about something. I'm sorry. That was good. But anyway. <laughs> Well, the, <laughs> with everyone. well, the key thing is we are able to cut out the first part of this where we're just making absolutely no sense and <laughs> slapping each other's backs. And then the back part of this where we talk shop uh, and you just get the meat of the oh, sandwich. You get the 966 exactly, hamburger the good patty. stuff. Yep. Um, We've got a great one too, Richard, this week. We've got just us, an executive nine, uh, 966 episode 72. <laughs> So we'll be talking about a few really exciting issues going on in Saudi Arabia this week. Before we get started, the typical reminder at the beginning, please subscribe to this wherever you're getting it, YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts. And if you leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, we will see that and it will make our weekend this weekend. So thank you very much for <laughs> all of you who have done that. Richard, shall yes, we? Let's we get shall. going. What's your one big thing this week? Costa Nostra, that's, I guess, our thing in Italian. Ah. Um, excuse me, I'm crying still. Uh, my, my one big thing. Well, last week we had, a, a you know, one of our yellows, um, we did, which we didn't go with, uh, talked about the PIF bringing in the Daria uh, uh, gate project as one of its gigas. So, it, you know, it moved out from four gigas to, to five and and I, I think I mentioned at the time I went down a, a wormhole on that one. Like, what are the gigas? And, you know, which ones are they? So I want to do a shout out here, actually, to our friend, uh, Faisal Durrani, who is the um, a partner and head of Middle East research at Knight Frank. Knight Frank does amazing stuff. And so they also, obviously, they're a real estate shop and, and they're much more than that. But uh, they track the, the the sector very closely in the region, throughout the region, and in Saudi Arabia as well. So I reached out to Faisal and I said, hey, look, you guys have some info on this. It's really good. I can't see it really well. Can you send me the updated things? And hopefully we can get these and include them on the YouTube version because they're really impressive. Uh, but anyway, Faisal has been talking recently. He's been in various publications talking about the total value of real estate and infrastructure projects since the launch of Saudi Arabia's uh, National Transformation Plan in 2016. The National Transformation Plan sort of was coincidental with the launch of Vision 2030. And, you know, and by, real, by, by Knight Frank's measurements, uh, that amount, the total value of real estate and infrastructure projects has now crossed the 1.1 US dollar trillion mark. Um, an extraordinary amount of of investment and uh, infrastructure projects underway, and the the point that Knight Frank is making is that um, you know the 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 extent of this is sort of it's hard to fathom, and basically they're saying, uh, you know, I'll just tease out some of the little parts of it. Um, Eight of the kingdom's giga projects involve construction of new cities, brand new cities, uh, many of which are, are along the western seaboard, you know, the Red Sea. Nearly $575 billion is being spent to deliver over 1.3 million new homes, more than 3 million square meters of world-class offices, and over 225,000 hotel rooms across Saudi Arabia. Arguably, uh, arguably unleashing the biggest development pipeline the region has ever seen. Um, but what I wanted to do, and, and, and I guess it's for the YouTube viewers, uh, mostly, um, is they track the giga projects. And when I was looking at the, the, the five under PIF, I started to sort of mentally, you know, try and uh, figure out how many they were in total. And, um, I didn't get to where, uh, Knight Frank has gotten. So they the, this 1.1 trillion that they're talking about, they're tracking 15 giga projects. And the and maybe we can put the uh, the link to the the infographic they have. You know, they they sort of enumerate each of the 15. But of course it includes Niyam, Alula, King Salman Park, 
Jeddah Central Project, these sorts of things, Jeddah Economic City, some some that you wouldn't know or have not heard of, or they're you know they're not you know sort of out in front like Neom or Red Sea or Kadia. But it's interesting because they have each one and then they have the the projected cost of it. So Neom, for example, projected cost five hundred billion. How much has been spent? U.S. seven point five billion. Uh, percentage of construction completed, Neom, 29%. Um, so it's a really interesting and useful uh, resource. They also track Riyadh's mega projects. So these are plans for the capital. And one of the things they're pointing out is extraordinary amount of investments that are going on in, in Riyadh. And so in total, those, those projects worth $1.4 billion, I'm sorry, $104 billion dollars putting in 2.8 million square meters of office space, 200,000 residential units, um, 13,000 hotel keys. Uh, but they, they, and, uh, they point out that there's, you know, giga projects aside, there's another eight mega projects that they called here. Um, like mall of Arabia, Misk foundation city, mall of Saudi, um, you know, and, and eight of these. And finally, Another infographic that they put out with it, which which I think Knight Frank pays a lot of attention to, they break down this 1.1 trillion in committed infrastructure investments. As I mentioned, 555,000 residential units, 275,000 plus hotel rooms, um, enormous retail space, enormous office space. Uh, but they also look at major education projects and they break down uh, you know, so for example, in this infographic, they have five education projects totaling 82 billion. Then they have uh, major well-being, sports, entertainment, and recreation projects. That's another 24 billion. Major healthcare projects, 13.8 billion. Um, and then major infrastructure projects in general, uh, 200 billion. And that would be things like the rapid uh, Riyadh rapid bus transit system. You're going to talk a little bit about the metro system. They also have the rapid bus transit system that they've spent close to two billion dollars on, to to bring that up to snuff. Um, new rail, new rail links, new Riyadh airport, uh, Mecca public transport. So um, it was interesting. Remember when John Fasfakianakis, who was a friend of ours, an excellent economist, we had a great episode with him. But he was talking about these eco projects, and he was talking about how. Apart from whatever value they may they may provide in terms of returns or or loss leaders or or change or sector development, they attract they attract people, they attract competent people, uh, and they also uh, you know generate a buzz and generate you know sort of a gravity in and of themselves. And you can see all this happening with these projects. Just extraordinary amounts of investment, and now coming to implementation phases. Some of them, like the Riyadh Metro, very close to completion. Uh, and and it, it, one of the reasons I wanted to do this, and I know it's a little disjointed, was the scale. Like Faisal Durrani has said, is enormous, and it's creating all these spinoffs. So, for example, these are investments, but it's also creating the hottest new real one of the hottest new real estate markets in the region. It's attracting people, you know, it, there's a, there's a brain, you know, there's attracting investment. Uh, I, you, it's interesting. Saudi Arabia is sort of poised now to, you know, seven years into the 2016 vision 2030 uh, to start reaping some benefits of all this investment and also start seeing the results of all this investment. But again, the scale of this is just enormous. Go back and listen to our conversation, please, with Faisal Durrani from Knight Frank. He is so good. Um, and you're right, Richard, he is, um, and, and Knight Frank generally, but his work with Knight Frank, I mean, he's in the media all the time and their research is truly valuable because it's independent and it's looking at the market, the Saudi market, the market in the region with sober and independent eyes. I mean, they, they, yeah. they have their own view on things and that's what they share with their investors and their subscribers and their clients. But it, all the work that they do at, at Knight Frank is, is 
tremendously valuable. And he is very knowledgeable about this sector. When we had him on in the summer of this year, Richard, it was just sort of one of those conversations where it was just all gravy, good information stuff that you just, just sit back and listen to. Just to jump into this, it's seems to me like right now the vibe or like the feeling or the sentiment is that Saudi Arabia is the next global real estate hotspot, uh, the next hot real estate investment destination. And I think that's true. I think you're seeing now um, corporates believe that that is true. You have invest corp holdings from, I think, Bahrain saying that they're going to invest a billion dollars over the next five years in the kingdom in real estate assets. There's another piece, Richard, um, I think it was now two weeks ago, um, Alex Galtsev of the Dubai-based property technology company Realist, Realist. I'm sorry for botching that, Alex. Um, they are even more optimistic about the real estate boom in Saudi. He said that the real estate market boom over the next 10 years, it could boom, excuse me, over the next 10 years with investors drawn to the kingdom via these giga projects you were just talking about, Richard. He said, quote, investors who want to buy real estate understand that if somebody committed to invest that much in the country, it's going to be growing. Saudi has a lot of potential for the next 10 years, and the next 10 years is going to be the greatest time for the Saudi property market, he said, bullishly, I added. Um, if you can invest in Riyadh, for example, buy 10, 20 apartments and leave mm -hmm. it for five years, you can come back and it will have grown 100, 200%. So that's, that is some, that would be some strong gains for those who are investing in the real estate market for sure. I think um, there's a lot changing about real estate globally. You have the pandemic and the switch from outside of cities, the decline in many places of office spaces, the permanency of remote work. Some of these trends are either here to stay, they may go, but um, Saudi Arabia seems to be sort of its own little market, not just in real estate, but also as the fastest growing uh, economy in the G20. It just sort of like in the last year did not really experience any of the global economic headwinds. And Richard, you can just visibly see the real estate boom happening in Riyadh. You can see it from the from the plane on the way in. I mean, you can't miss it when you're driving it around. And, you know, as we'll talk in a little bit um, about the metro, you could just see it. You And it's, you know, so you get these analysts talking about, well, real estate investing and, and the growth of real estate and these giga projects and giga projects seem have seemed like ideas. But now it's clear that they're not. They're actually taking root and they're being built. And that is good for the real estate market. And I hear from my Saudi friends, our Saudi friends, about how exciting real estate is now as an investment in Riyadh. Um, right. But just a you know word of caution, this just feels to me, and I, I'm going to sound like I'm 50 years older than I actually am, but the market, <laughs> uh, real estate market is like any market and it is cyclical. So there are going to be boom and bust cycles. And the sort of boundless optimism that is going into real estate investing in Riyadh kind of gives me the vibe of this can only go up. There is no such thing as a sure thing when it comes to investing. And there are a lot of people building new houses, but there's also a lot of speculation going on. And so there it is. And yeah. it's, it, it's related to excitement. And we've talked about it on the show a lot. Uh, um, this is, you know, Riyadh, Saudi Arabia is having a moment and it's not a moment that's unearned. It's a, and it's not a moment that's just happened. I mean, so they started this project, this Vision 2030 project 2016. They've invested a lot of uh, money. They've made some smart decisions. They're moving along in, in, a, in a variety of, of different areas. We're starting to see results in tourism and, and, and other things and, and development. Uh, and they're having this moment where they've managed themselves well fiscally, and they've also been in a commodity super cycle in terms of oil. Uh, so while the rest of the world is, has generally been very sluggish and in some places, you know, uh, in recessionary situations. So Saudi Arabia is a bright spot. That's why you have people running, you know, people, you know, bankers are just flocking to, to, to Riyadh. You know, people want to do IPOs, uh, real estate markets. So it is a moment. It's not that it's not, you know, it, it, I think you're right. You know, it, it, we have to be alert and it probably will inevitably, you know, cool. Uh, but it's, it's a moment. Uh, it's very, um, it's fortuitous for Saudi Arabia, I guess, and maybe not the rest of the world, but it's fortuitous in that they had been putting in the work. Mm -hmm. They've been laying the groundwork, you know, being more fiscally responsible, you know, making regulatory changes, you know, diversifying their economy, making these key investments, seeking uh, direct investment from from abroad. 
And, you know, they've come out of COVID in great shape, while the rest of the world is not so great shape, especially after the Russian invasion of Ukraine. So it, it, it's a moment, and it's a good moment, and we should celebrate it. But, you know, smart investors, you know, to look at the long term. But the thing is, again, once again, we always talk about this when you look at, you know, entertainment opportunities, sports yes. opportunities, investment opportunities. Saudi is in the conversation in a real way. And it, that's not been the case a decade ago, 15 years ago. Yes. And that is a very consistent theme on this program. And um, Richard, just sort of back to your original point. I mean, what makes Riyadh and some of these other areas in Saudi Arabia an attractive destination is not just the economic diversification happening, which is causing an economic boom. It's the social development, like you said, entertainment. I mean, it, it's it's infinitely more Riyadh is infinitely more livable today than it was 10 years ago because there's stuff to do and there's restaurants to go to and their social norms have been relaxed. And yeah, one thing that's been constant that you and I have talked about forever is just the welcoming, good natured Saudi people that are just so hospitable, uh, almost to the point of just it seems unbelievable. Um, so these places are livable. They're, they're increasingly more livable. It becomes more realistic for somebody to take a job in Riyadh and say, well, I'm living in Riyadh and it's actually great. There's a lot to do. <laughs> Ronaldo lives here now. <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, Richard, that's a good one. And actually mine, my one big thing this week is very simil similarly tied to yours. This is two weeks in a row that we basically had the same idea. But I just would like to talk a little bit about the Riyadh Metro project. Um, which is almost done according to, well, two reports. One report today in Arabian Business, um, which you shared with me, and then also according to our forthcoming exclusive conversation with Mr. Jacob Mum, who is Managing Director for Bechtel Saudi Arabia, he will we will be talking with him next week, but we are hearing from him and from um, th this report in Arabian Business, which actually cited... Um, Rai Al Yum, um, part of the uh, which which cited the German news agency. So there's a couple like reports of reports, but the Riyadh Metro project is almost done. It looks done if in Riyadh. I mean, it connects to the airport. Um, it looks done, but I think there's a lot of testing that has to happen soon. If you stay tuned to the 966 next week, you will find out what remains. But the project is the largest public transport network in the world. There's Richard, we talked about this today. There are so many superlatives with this project. It's absolutely massive. The announcement that it will be done in March and start operation, operating in March with all lines operating by the end of the year was made by Fad al-Rashid, who is the CEO of the Royal Commission for Riyadh City. The first phase, as I said, is going to start in March, but it will be done by the end of the year. And it's just, it's, um, you know, it represents the end of, I think, about a decade and $22.5 billion of investment. And when we talk about the livability of Riyadh and a changing city, I mean, you'll be able to take the metro from landing at the airport to your hotel or to a neighborhood that is nearby. And it should change the, the traffic in Riyadh, which is still quite... Um, you know, onerous, especially starting at about three o'clock in the afternoon is really a lot to deal with. So, you know, kudos to to people who live in Riyadh because this will change that and it will change the sort of flow of life and the, and the movement of people around the city. It, it's just an unbelievable uh, engineering accomplishment for Bechtel and other companies. And I mean, it it is it was an expensive it is an expensive investment by the government to provide the service to people of of Riyadh, citizens living there. Just, I mean, that's it's a very short one, big thing, Richard, this week, but um, it's very, very, very exciting to see this come online. We've seen it under construction, you know, for years. And uh, it's just amazing. It would be, uh, it, it's hard to, yes, it's. I think it's coming this year. It would be great if it came in March. Fahad al-Rashid, by the way, the, the CEO of Royal Commission for Riyadh City, Boy, I'd love to have him on this show. And I'd love to have anybody from RCRC because they're doing such interesting stuff and they're getting all getting ready to to sort of bid for the 2030 Expo, Expo 2030. Um, uh, so, uh, yes, it, it, you know, I think there's a lot of excitement and there seems to be building. I, I think the expectation will be delivered in 2023, maybe not March, but hopefully 2023. But uh, as you say, it will... It will transform, 
hopefully it will transform in a significant, you know, in, in, in a, a, a real way, the, the, how you get around Riyadh and people will use it. The, the excitement is terrific. You know, I mentioned in my, um, in my one big thing that, you know, in addition to the Metro, there's also a significant investment right now in expanding public transportation, just bus system and that sort of thing in general around Riyadh, all trying to, to mitigate this significant uh, traffic problem, which we're all familiar with. And it's, you know, so, so they're making an effort. Let's hope people take to it. You know, public transportation is not a given, you know, <laughs> we, we live in the DMV, uh, uh, you know, and, and people just like their cars and it's, it's a car culture in Saudi Arabia, just like it is here. So hopefully they'll, they'll, you know, rewire and reorient and find, you know, find that it's a better way to get around. And, uh, and because obviously it's a more efficient, less, you know, less polluting, polluting way to get around. So, uh, but again, you know, it's coming online after 10 years, uh, 22, 20 billion plus dollar plus project, just extraordinary. It's happened. If you look at the timeline and compared to other things, you know, the, perhaps the largest public transportation project uh, underway it's just, it's going to be great that when it arrives, really exciting. Yeah. It's interesting to public transportation, mega projects like this giga projects. Um, that it, it's not a, if you build it, they will come or they will use it type thing. I mean, there are many Metro systems around the world that are not used at capacity because they are not known for their timeliness or reliability. I mean, well, so for example, the the Washington D.C. Metro does not have a very good reputation because it's often, you know, off schedule and it is not operating late at night, and they've had some budget cuts. So it's an incredible engineering feat that goes underneath the city and all over the place. And really, you can use it to get anywhere, but um, it's not the fastest way to get around, even with some traffic. Um, so the next challenge is is operating it with efficiency and and providing the, the service of, of quality, um, you know, service to, to those who use it. I mean, making sure that it runs on time, making sure that it's safe for citizens. And, and so that, that'll be the next challenge, but yeah, I mean, and, you know, adding more Metro stations, like building out the bus network to connect these stations as well. It, the, the work is really also just beginning for them. So yeah, it's, it's exciting. Richard, we'll have to take it next time we go over there and just sit there and ride around. It'll be sweet. Uh, really looking forward to that. Really yep. looking forward to that. That would be cool because I think it's, a lot of design effort has gone into it. So I think it's, it's probably going to be functional as well as beautiful. I mean, beautiful as well as functional. Um, so yeah, this is exciting. It's a big deal. It's a big deal. And this is one of those things we're talking about, you know, the, the, you know, this was started uh, over a decade ago. A lot of things are starting to come online. They'll start mm -hmm. coming online. You know, we'll see see, see people going to Red Sea uh, development. We're seeing people in Doria. Um, you know, there's there's project uh, there's there's progress on projects across the board. Significant quality of life issues as well as as well as just operational and and you know you know economic pluses. So I mean, it's really exciting. This will be a big marker, though. This will be especially because as Riyadh sees itself as a city of the future that wants to significantly expand its population, this will be a backbone event. Yep. Foundational. Yep. Richard, let's get to Yella. And we just want to remind our, our listeners and viewers that next week we will be having a conversation with Jacob Mum, who is head of Bechtel Saudi Arabia. We do talk with him about the Riyadh Metro and it's going to be really good. So stay tuned for that. And Richard, we're going to jump right into Yella this week. Yella. Um, Yella. Yella. <laughs> all right uh yella number one you know we've given this short trip and i love this event so we'll get this uh nasser alatia holds off lobe to win dakar rally 2023 nasser alatia captured a second straight dakar rally on sunday in dominant fashion moving into second place in the event's all-time list in the process alatia by the way is cuttery and so it's he's it, this is kind of cool Mm -hmm. Alatia now has five wins and what has been considered rally racing's top event. Stefan Peter Hansel holds an all time record with 14 Dakar wins. He's still racing, by the way, eight of which came in the premier car category. Sebastian Loeb finished in second place, but was more than 80 minutes behind in the overall standings. Talk about something, Richard, that is incredible to follow in the news because it is all just absolutely mind-blowing photographs um 
this is considered this this route. I learned a lot about the Dakar Rally in the last ninety minutes. No, really? <laughs> but yeah. This is this is the and we we talked about it last year as well. Um, I don't really understand it because it's it's sort of like you're you're going in stages and you you win stages, but to me that's not the point. The point seems to be that it is just an incredible challenge for anyone involved. There isn't a huge prize package for those who win. It's just sort of like a test against yourself. I mean, a test, a test against the, the durability of man and his car. This was considered to be the toughest Dakar route in recent memory. Um, according to some, all of this I've read, this is not my opinion. Um, but it, so, so they reveal the route before the race starts, like right before, right? So you don't really know where to go. There's no, advanced knowledge you're actually just winging it as the driver um and so this is the fourth the car to be held among the uh, among the rolling dunes of saudi arabia it's the 45th ever installment of the event but the the fourth ever in saudi arabia richard the other thing that i didn't really realize is truly and i sort of mentioned this how dangerous the sport is um mm-hmm. there were at least two really bad crashes this year i think a spectator unfortunately was uh killed uh, Joan Barita had a bad crash, broken vertebrae, fractured pelvis. Ah. Um, Ricky Brabeck uh, crashed at stage three. He was the first American to win the race. Um, he's he was out after the third stage. I mean, you got to have some chutzpah to, <laughs> to take this on. I, it, it's it's not nothing. Um, it's a big deal, and you know I, I get excited about this. So I want you mentioned it. It's the forty fifth Dakar Rally. This is like this is a big deal. And this is like a this is like a pride thing, like you say. I mean, but this was first started in 70, 1978. So it was it was the Paris Dakar Rally. So it was that one, that version of it until 2009. And so security reasons, they moved to South America. Moved to Saudi in 2020, again for security reasons, because of what they couldn't do a safe race and and they couldn't guarantee the safety in in, in South America, just like they couldn't do the in, with the Paris Dakar rally. So, so Saudis had it, and and apparent, and you know, it, the, the 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 terrain, the country is just custom made for fantastic, amazingly difficult but beautiful and challenging driving, and I, you know, this has attracted me so many ways. You've got you've got five categories. So you've got the ones you got motorbikes. We're talking. You're talking what thirteen thousand kilometers and what 10, 11, 12, 13 stages, whatever. Just so so motorbikes that's one quads which is you know the four by four sort of you know that we're familiar with then lightweight vehicles and i guess dania akil who's a saudi female driver and actually did pretty well in this race drives one of these lightweight vehicles cars and then you have various things of cars and then trucks um but the cool thing is you can you know the guy you can show up with a full team modified heavily modified you know reinforced all this uh, and race, you can also show up with a Range Rover mm-hmm. and, and try and do it. Do you know what I mean? You, so, you know, it, so, so it has both, it's both, it has both teams who are all in modified, super, you know, specialized arcane stuff and guys who come up and sort of, you know, bulk out maybe their, their off the line, uh, you know, uh, whatever it is, you know, and, and, and make a go at it. And it's just, it's like a people's race of craziness where everyone's, it is dangerous and it's grueling. It's just awesome. And I'd love to do it, but it, you know, it, it would just beat the hell out of us. So, um, do all the, so it's just the first one to win. So like the, it could be a motorcycle one year, it could be a Range Rover another year. No, it's each class, each they, class, every, every class has a winner. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so, um, Al Atia was the winner, um, of his class, but there was a winner in the motorcycle and, and is there like a premier class? Is there one that's like sort of the toughest? So the one you, the ones you hear about mostly are the cars and specifically the T1 cars. These are the, the heavily modified with, with teams following them and this and that that's T1. And then there's T2, uh, and these are production off-road vehicles that have been, you know, so, you know, you can show up. Uh, and then there's actually open. So, so, but the ones you hear about are that T1, which are cars. But again, we, we watch a lot of, you know, you see video on it and it's awesome. You got the motorcycles and it was doubly interesting this year because of all the rains. So you had people who were, you had to deal with not only typical desert, you know, mat, you know, vast swaths of, of, of sand, 
but you also had mud bogs and 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 you know a lot of motorbikes and and quads in particular you know up to their axles and in, in mud and stuff uh just to add to the fun because it's also going through rocky territory too uh and like you say I, I don't to be honest i think every i think someone has died every iteration of the saudi one and it's not specific to saudi arabia it's because people die and get injured because you're you're you know you're racing hard in in unfamiliar terrain you have spectators standing around trying to get the best view <laughs> it's it's you know this is like a throwback when you didn't have lawyers you just sort of you you just did this stuff and 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 you know you went banging around in the desert or whatever and and people came out to watch and if you were you know if you were standing on the wrong side of a dune you know sorry I, about that i i mean i'm i get a lot of crap richard from uh, my friends for refusing to drive a car in saudi arabia in general because i think it's way too scary but then there's like another level of driving a car in saudi arabia and it's the dakar <laughs> rally and it's actually the most hardcore thing ever if um, just one observation on this, uh, this makes enormous sense to me as to why Saudi Arabia hosts this event, because they really have a lot um, of interest in developing tourism. I mean, there's just no better way to show how diverse the landscape is in Saudi Arabia than the Dakar rally, where you have these incredible photographers following around these cars, catching air off of dunes. And it's just like, look at how beautiful Saudi Arabia is. It's really it's cool. This is, you know, this, this race, you know, was custom made for drones, mm -hmm. you know, I oh, mean, you, you get to see, you get to see even more of this race because drones are just flying, you know, tracking somebody out in the middle of the desert or through rocky, craggy stuff or whatever. You know, the footage is just astounding. I, I think what you don't realize when you see the footage from a distance is how hard the driving is, you know, it's dirty and gritty and loud and, and it's, beats the hell out of you because you're running across difficult terrain you know like you said you know we they don't necessarily know exactly where they're going so they're trying to track uh markers and, and everybody's racing <laughs> everybody's going at it and but also i you know from what i can tell it's very collegial i mean people help each other out you don't you know it's it, you, by the nature of it it's a it's a grueling race that everybody pays in in some way so people look out for each other yeah, I, I was going to say, this just seems like such a niche thing. It just seems like such a hobbyist thing, but it's not. I mean, it's I mean, it's covered by ESPN. It's on, um, I think it was on ES, uh, maybe it was NBC Sports, but it was on, um, you know, streaming TV, at least here in the US. I mean, Reuters covered it every day. And like I said, yeah. the photographers. So it's not like some small thing, but there isn't a big payout. It's not like the winner gets $10 million. It's just pride and and bragging rights and an entry in wikipedia i mean it's just it's incredible yeah these guys are i'd love to hang out with some of these guys and have some drinks and hear some of the stories they they have to shed because it would be pretty amazing so um, it was um the founder i mean and i, I think it, it, it harks back to its roots i think it's it's it stayed pretty clear to its roots i mean the founder was some french guy you know, I guess, you know, I don't know what the lore is, but I mean, apparently Ginger Baker, who was a drummer for Cream, apparently in 1974, wanted to go play gig with a buddy in, in Senegal. So he drove his Range Rover, you know, and made that trip, you know, off the line Range Rover, <clears throat> and it made it. And it sort of sparked the idea of what about these? And then the guy is Thierry something. He's a Frenchman. Uh, uh, then he came up with, uh, you know, let's do this race. Let's do this, this ridiculous 10, you know, 10, 10 15,000 kilometer race. And let's all go have fun and do it. And, and then it, 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 it sort of, you can, you can sort of still see that spirit and, and it still, it seems to exist in, in the, in the rally today. And maybe I'm mistaken. Maybe it's, you know, hopefully hyper-commercialized, maybe there's a lot of, I don't know, but from the outside, it looks like it's held true to its original spirit of, of doing this crazy stuff of crashing about across country for, you know, a bunch of stages and, and let's see how fast we can go. If we can keep the, the, the stinking machine together and let's have fun doing it. Yeah. And, and Richard, I kind of remember last year they had, uh, it's sort of a good press opportunity for a few things last year. I think a Ramco debuted a hydrogen truck. Yeah, I just kind of remember it looking like one of those Sandwalker things in, in <laughs> Star Wars. Just been like, neon, Neon's all over the place on it. Yeah, 
in terms of yeah. advertising. Great branding opportunity. And I think Red Bull, I mean, it's just like the, <laughs> it's really a good magnet for the hardcore brands. We've spent a lot of time on, on Dakar, Richard. I made a little mental note here to uh, put a list together of people that we can reach out to and have them on the 966 talking about the Dakar rally. It, it, do you know uh, if... I yeah, want to get, I've already reached, I'm trying to get hold of Dan, uh, Dania, Dania Akil, who's, okay. who, who races this and is a, a, a very successful, uh, uh, Saudi female driver and has races a lot in a lot of different venues and would be really cool. So I'm trying to get hold of her. If any of our listeners know how we might do this, she'd be great on the show. She's and probably I, listening right now, to be honest. So Donnie, join us. No Don't doubt. hold back. We want to hear some no stories. <laughs> I will say all the shout outs and requests we've put on our, our episodes. Um, uh, have yielded nothing. <laughs> well, I don't know about that. Actually, it is amazing how many people listen to this. Oh no! Again, we're just hitting the on button. No, I know what you were saying, but uh, th- th- you know, uh, you know, thousands and millions. I mean, we're getting a lot of of listeners. But you know, when we're, the, the, you know, I, you know, why this key, you know, why this key senior executive in this, you know, government <laughs> ministry isn't listening to us and responding to us immediately? I just don't know why. Yeah. Well, <laughs> they should. <laughs> We've got a powerful. Uh, powerful That's stage cool. here so yeah, yeah. <laughs> um i hope that joan Barita and ricky brabeck get well soon richard do you know if the the car is in saudi next year as well or is it um i, I believe it is but uh, i mean i can't say for sure but i think it is yeah I, I haven't heard anything anybody bidding bills bidding for it and it's a problematic event because like we say i mean it was you know basically al-qaeda was the one that disrupted the the european one the original paris dakar one and then, you know, various criminal and, and drug and criminal, you know, cartels in in, in uh, South America disrupted other ones. Saudi Arabia is a, a wonderfully perfect place for it because you can, you know, there's a high level of security. There's a, a, a great uh, variety of terrain. There's tremendous amounts of territory to run it wherever you want to run it. So uh, I don't know who else wants to step up and do it, but who knows? Yeah. Really cool. Richard, Yella number two, the 53rd edition of the World Economic Forum opened on Monday in Davos, Switzerland, where leaders from across the globe will meet to discuss the global economy. The meeting follows a tumultuous year for the global economy with rising food prices driven by Russia's invasion of Ukraine, which began almost a year ago in February 2022, and which saw numerous countries imposing sanctions on many Russian politicians and oligarchs. Hashtag Yacht Watch. A number of high-ranking officials from Saudi Arabia, including Saudi ambassador to the United States, Princess Rima bint Bandar Al Saud, and Economy Minister Faisal Al Ibrahim will attend the conference and participate in a number of panel discussions. Richard, I just should add here um, that Saudi Arabia's Minister of Investment, Khaled Al Fala, is also there. I saw on social media there's a lot, there's a, a lot of high-level Saudis there this year. Uh, a lot of people from the Middle East this year. And this is one of the reasons I thought we should cover this because it's running from the 16th to the 20th. So tomorrow's the last day. Um, interesting point of comparison. So at the 2015 World Economic Forum, Saudi Arabia sent four mm-hmm. representatives. Turkey Al Faisal, Prince Turkey Al Faisal Al Saud, who we've had on the show, is brilliant. Mm-hmm. Uh, Fahad Al Mubarak, who's governor of Saudi Arabian Monetary Agency, who we know. Uh, Ibrahim al Asaf, Minister of Finance. Um, have I told you the story? So there, there's a, you know, there's 99 names for God in 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 in, in, in Arabic and and many more than that. And he used to joke. He's a Minister of Finance. <clears throat> he used to joke that I have 99 ways to say no. <laughs> Everybody's appealing to him for money. <laughs> um, and then the fourth person, person in 2015 is Taufik al Rabia, who was then Minister of Commerce. Again, we, we've done a major event with that Ministry of Commerce, and he was the, the head there, and he was the one who, who really made it possible. And he's now the current uh, Minister of, of Hajj and Umrah, I believe. Uh, a, a terrifically capable guy. So this is four people, and all four, pe- four people you would expect, you know, the governor of Osama, the central bank, minister of finance, minister of commerce, and then, of course, Turkey Al Faisal, who was, who was sort of a, just a, a very senior and well, you know, well-respected person. And I will tell you, 
you know, when they would do these things, the World Economic Forum, Davos, it was like kind of a thing. Oh, you know, we're going to go. It's kind of neat just to be invited and, we're, you know, this sort of thing. 2023, completely different. I mean, you had those four. Uh, now you have nine representatives from Saudi Arabia. And not only are they nine representatives, so more than double. But there's panels on Saudi Arabia. They're all speakers. So let's run, run them down. You know, Minister of Finance, Mohammed al Jadan, Foreign Minister, uh, Prince Faisal bin Farhan, Saudi Ambassador to the U.S., Princess Rima, uh, Economy Minister, Faisal al Ibrahim, Minister of Industry, Bandar al Kharayev, Minister of Communications and Information Technology, Abdul al Swaha, um, Minister of State of Foreign Affairs, Adil al Jaber, Minister of Investment, Khalil al Fala, who you mentioned, CEO of Royal Commission for Riyadh City, Fahad al-Rashid, who we referenced earlier. Uh, all going there. Everybody's a buzz about what's going on in Saudi Arabia. Like I said, they just finished a panel yesterday, or maybe it was this morning, about what's going on in Saudi Arabia, econ economic bright spot and everything. All these people are not only in attendance, they're featured speakers. A whole vibe is different. Saudi Arabia's at, uh, approach to it, position to it, deference paid to them, completely different. And they've upped their game considerably, and they just they just swing a bigger bat, you know, than they used to. And these global forums, uh, it's quite apparent that they swing a bigger bat than they ever did before. What do you think hotel prices are like in, in top of Switzerland right now? <laughs> One would assume that they are exorbitant. Um, I, sure, I wish I had a little two room chalet, you know, you know, that I could rent out for a week. See, we just talked about real estate investing. There that seems go. like a really good one. You pay for the whole year with just one week, um, then use it for the rest of the year to catch the the right. slopes. Yeah, um, I don't have much to add. That was really good, Richard. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Um, it, it's funny because too, they it's like, well, yeah, that's that, I'm gonna put a bow on it right there because we'll, we'll move on. But it, it's a good point, and yeah, this this was sort of like a, a absolutely more confident Saudi Arabia, a more well because it's an emerging it's an emerging power. It really is economically, politically, you know, regionally, um, but I mean globally as well. We just talked about Russia, so yeah, very very interesting times. Um, they were in high demand, and and social media showed that there were a number of sort of breakout sessions. They all look completely full. There was a lot of interest in getting FaceTime with some of these guys so and ladies. So Richard, Yella, number... Oh, it's yours, actually. Sorry. Oh, no, it is. Uh, a little foot-stepping on, on my, my behalf. My bad, my bad. I was, I was dawdling. Uh, number three, more Saudi women assume diplomatic posts. The number of Saudi women assuming diplomatic posts has increased to five with the addition of Ambassador Nisreen al Shibul and Haifa al Judea to the list of Saudi representatives in the kingdom's embassies abroad. They joined Princess Rima bint Bandar al Saud, who took over the duties of the Saudi embassy in Washington, becoming at that time the first Saudi woman to hold the position of ambassador. She was later joined by Amal Muallami, uh, ambassador to Norway, and uh, NS al Shahwan, uh, ambassador to Sweden. So you made a mistake, Richard. You should have given me this one so that I would have had to pronounce all the names. So I just really enjoyed bad. that. I couldn't believe you didn't do that. Um, <laughs> file this under unthinkable a decade ago. Um, I've seen a lot of these names before. Impressive resumes for all. More of this. Um, and just this is the time to mention it. Princess Rima, just in my opinion, um, and I, I think yours as well, Richard, just one of the all-time great communicators, amazing presence about her, the perfect ambassador for Saudi Arabia to the United States. And there are more women like her in Saudi Arabia that could well represent their country abroad. And so this is just, I mean, this is progress. It's the type of progress where if there were no real progress going on on the ground in Saudi Arabia, people would say, well, this is just, you know, they're just sort of rolling women out to be ambassadors, but they're not making any real changes. This actually is representative of the changes that are happening for Saudi women right now. So it's very cool to see. And I think it's important to note, this is this is not a sop to, you know, critics of Saudi Arabia. No, yeah. yeah. These women are uh, surpassingly capable. And you, you read the bios of each of these women. Uh, this is, you know, this is putting your best foot forward. This has nothing to do with, oh, we'll make people feel better and look, we, you know, all this. These are really capable individuals, capable diplomats, and, you know, have, have the chops uh, 
so you know and and, and i i assume there's going to be many more to come uh because they do they do they're exceptionally well qualified and uh and again like i say they're not doing this to you know to try and improve their image uh it doesn't hurt but all these these diplomats you know earn the position and uh and really are worthy of the post I should add, so this is five, I don't know how many total diplomats they have abroad. I looked at the US and you know, we have we have a problem with, you know, seats going unfulf- unfilled. Um, but uh, there are ne- current there are 26 women uh female US ambassadors currently. Um yeah, I don't know how many states, you know, it's probably over 100 that we would be uh, you don't have representatives. Not all of them, again, have ambassadors appointed at, at currently. But anyway, 26 women uh, as a point of comparison for what that's worth. Just really cool. Richard Yella, number four. Saudi Arabia keeps up pace of women's development hosting first international tournament. Another story on a similar vein. Saudi Arabia, who launched a bid to host the AFC Women's Asian Cup in 2026, have taken a further step forward with women with the women's game in the country with the mom hosting the kingdom's first ever women's 11 aside international tournament the four team tournament featuring saudi arabia comoros pakistan and mauritius kicked off january 11th and runs until january 19th the hosting of the tournament in Dhamam is being hailed as a major milestone for the women's game as the country seeks to achieve a first fifa ranking a women's first division is to follow while the Saudis have also launched a school, a schools league for young women. Um, all in, by the way, we should note that today uh, is that friendly between Paris St. Germain and the Riyadh all-stars. Yes. And it's currently five, three in a defensive struggle. It's currently <laughs> five, three Paris St. Germain <laughs> in, the, in the second half. Ronaldo scored twice. Messi scored once. Mbappe scored. Uh, yeah, so, you know, th- th- they're getting their money's worth for sure. And but again, Richard- this is probably like an all-star game, an NBA all-star game. Nobody's playing defense. Yeah, or like the home run derby. <laughs> 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 well, I mean, nobody wants to see a 0-0 score in that game, no, yeah. uh, especially the guy that paid $2.6 million for the uh, special <laughs> access to it. Um, so Richard- back to- Yeah, go back. Sorry. My bad about the women. So. So again, we talk about this, and and I've said before, I, uh, we've put out an invitation to someone who can come and talk about sports washing. Uh, has spent a lot of time analyzing it, and uh, nobody's denying it. But our point all along is that it's it's co- it's organically tied to some larger purposes within Saudi Arabia, and you see this with the women's league. So, um, you know, the first Saudi women's tournament was held in two thousand and eight. Seven teams participated. Uh, February 2020 decided to launch a women's league, football league for women in the whole country. So November 2020, uh, 24 teams were launched. So they had a tournament. They've had now had two championships. And interestingly enough, just like the men's side, you know, where Al Halal and Al Nasser are sort of historically the leading football clubs for the women, the, the, the winner in 2021 was Al Halal. And 21, 21, 22 was Al Nasser. So, um, so they're building this, you know, they're building this culture as well, along with the men's and it, and it's, it's quite exciting. They're trying to get a FIFA rating for their national team. This is one of the reasons they're doing these invitationals um, and their international matches. They, they, they've had their first international match against the Seychelles earlier this year, you know, they're they're moving it forward they're trying to get the you know a female side to to complement the male side um and really exciting to watch yeah super cool super cool i'm trying not to watch the game right now richard i just have a live score thing <laughs> <laughs> um I think this number is you, f- right? Yep. Four, yep. No, is it me? Yep. Uh, number five. Yep. Damn, I've dropped the ball twice now. My apologies. Um, number five, defending his crown, Saudi issues lineup 
deals ahead of big ECM year. After a strong IPO year across the GC, the King, GCC, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia is poised to strengthen its claim as the region's strongest IPO hub in 2023, fueled by a pipeline of mega listings and private mandates. According to uh, Deal Logic data, there was uh, $9.37 billion worth of IPO issuance on the local exchange to Dawul last year, uh, just above the $8.5 billion recorded in Dubai and the um, $4.6 billion recorded in Abu Dhabi. January is already proving busy for the kingdom's capital markets. Last week, four private sector issues. Again, I should have given this to you. Mm-hmm. Uh, manufacturer al Watanian for Industries Company, Jamjum Pharma, Morawid Manpower Company, and Marabaha Marina Financing Company gained regulatory approval from the Saudi Arabia's Capital Markets Authority to the list on the Tadawal. You should have given that to me. I would have aced all of those names. I've, I've gone <laughs> twice now. I got to think these through. We are due for a, a conversation this quarter, I think, just with somebody who can really talk to a lot of the stuff going on in this sector. Um, do you have somebody in mind? We should get uh, Fahad al Malki back. Remember, we talked with him very early about, and they actually, and he knows he knows the market really well, and they yeah. actually might have run some IPOs. So yes, yeah, I, th- I agree with you. You're spot on. Mm-hmm. It's, it's time to come back and visit this. Yeah, because there's just there's a lot going on, and it just seems like every single one of these is oversubscribed. Um, so and, and even down to the Nomu market. So. Yeah, this will be another big year for for IPOs in Saudi Arabia, and we're just getting started with it. So this is uh, very exciting to see. I've not done much research into this, so I don't have much to add. But yeah, I mean, this is um, this will be something to watch this year. I am. Um, I want to recommend. So a lot of this was uh, from an article in Ion Athletic and Ion Analytics, and that's not Ion as E Y. It's I O N. Analytics. I don't know if it's meant to be a pun or whatever, but uh, it's an article by Samuel Kerr and Cristiano Dallabona uh, in January 10th. I recommend it because it talks a lot about the, the 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 region and the IPOs, and there's some really interesting factoids. We talked about IPO proceeds over the last 12 months, and you know broke it down. Uh, by the way, you, you know while Saudi Arabia was 8.45 billion over that period last 12 months, just point of comparison. Israel was 100 million, Kuwait 323 million, Egypt 82 million. You know, basically it's Saudi Arabia and the Emirates that are pumping along on this. Um, but here's an interesting little factoid. I, I, I take it or leave it. I don't know. From this com- the, from this article, uh, quote: Aside from a deeper local market, the appeal for investors in Saudi is driven by pure economics. Saudi IPOs have generated a weighted return of 46.4% over the last three years, substantially outperforming IPOs in the UAE as well as local equity benchmarks. So by comparison, so over the last four years, Saudi IPOs, 46.4 on average return weighted. UAE IPOs, 9.9. General MSCI GCC countries combined, 10%. Uh, the emerging market index overall minus 2.7%, frontier markets minus 3.4%. We were talking earlier about real estate and our one big thing and talking about Saudi Arabia having a moment. And part of their part of their moment, obviously, is because they've, they've put in a lot of work and they've set the groundwork. The other part of the moment is they're the only ones pumping along in a, in a generally down global market. And you can you can see this here. But I think that's impressive that, you know, that their IPO average return weighted is close to five times greater than UAE IPOs. It really was kicked off, Richard, with the big Aramco IPO. Mm-hmm. And then this year, you should have two big ones, I think. Aramco's trading unit, which was rumored, and uh, we shared a report uh, in Sustig last week. And then reports that Neom may have an IPO. And I don't know if that'll be this year. Who knows if they'll actually go forward with that. But those are two big ones on the horizon that may just be the, this article calls them white whales. Um, and and just, you know, who knows? So those could really, those could really sort of set this apart even farther. Uh, just totally blow everything else out if, if either of those two, or especially if both of them are listed. In numbers, absolutely, and 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 to, but but there's another is an interesting article in Axios on the middle Middle East IPO train keeps rolling. But they make the point, and this is this is the tick over that 
planners want when you go into you know re revamping the whole uh, Saudi stock exchange and you know, changing regulations, taking changing qualifying things, making it easier to list, all these things that have happened. This is what you want to see happening, and this is from that Axios report. And I'm going to quote him. Much of the Middle East's current IPO wave, IPO wave has been to privatize state-owned companies and government-related entities. The next phase is expected to come from large family-owned corporations looking to liquidate some of their ownership. That's what you want. You know, you've now made a platform attractive enough that people want to, you know, want to, you know, go public with their companies because they see the returns, they see the advantages, and they trust the system. I could see some of these fintech investments as well getting ready and gearing up for an IPO. I mean, if you're a, if you have a, a Saudi company that is growing, not just some of these that, that we've listed, but new startups that are starting to get hot and getting into series D and getting ready for potentially an IPO, you want it to go out this year if you can. I mean, because with, with such high demand for these IPOs, you want to, you want to be one of those oversubscribed stories. So, um, yeah, I mean, this is sort of like the snowball getting bigger and bigger. And uh, yeah, it's a really good point, Richard. Um, number six, yellow number six, and we're gonna, we'll put a bow on it with this as we always do, move over PIF. Saudi Arabia launches the EIF, the Events <laughs> Investment Fund. Saudi Arabia has launched an investment fund to support the culture, tourism, entertainment, and sports industries, according to the SPA. The Events Investment Fund will focus on developing and increasing direct foreign investment opportunities for a contribution of 28 billion real which is $7.45 billion to the country's GDP by 2045. Um, I had a good quote here. Uh, here we are. So again, I don't know. I don't know what the proper image is. It's not a puzzle because you, you know, the puzzle is sort of static. You're putting things in place, but it, maybe it's a, some sort of, I don't know, something you put on top of each other as you build a higher place. You just see them putting things together, you know, in terms of the tourism industry, especially. And, and in each situation, and, and this is PI, has always has been in frequently sectors, the, 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 the initiating engine, the catalyst that gets things going, makes it early investment. We talked about it all the time, lost leaders. Uh, to get to this point, uh, actually get to a future point, but this is a key point along this where they're going, okay. We've got enough of a, of a sector and enough of a foundation for a sector uh, that we are now going to put out projects that are, are investable. And that's what this is all about. You know, they're going, okay, take a look at our tourism sector, see how it's growing. You know, we had 60 million people last year. We had it to 100 million people. Take a, you know, take a look at how we're reinforcing it with aviation and that sort of thing. Take a look at all the uh, hotels we're building. All right, you can see that this is coming. So you should invest now. And this is how you, this is your vehicle to do it. And, you know, they're basically saying, all right, we want, you know, EIF assets. These are things that they're going to, projects that they're going to, you know, either green light or they own, but uh, that are investable, include indoor arenas, art galleries, theaters, conference centers, horse racing tracks, auto racing tracks, other events facilities across the kingdom. Uh, with the aim of delivering its first asset by 2023. So it's something we talk about all along, you know, step by step, they're trying to build it up, build it up, and trying to make it investable, trying to in attract foreign direct investment, trying to, you know, privatize, trying to make these things self-sustaining, you know, healthy, thriving sectors, and not just government, you know, initiatives. They start with government initiatives, start with PIF investment. But so this is an interesting, you know, this is a logical next step to try and uh, try and say, all right, we've got we've got the core of a tourism industry. We've got the core of an event industry. Uh, now come and make some money and invest in it. Yeah. And if we're going to mention sports, we should round out the show by mentioning golf. It looks like the. Live Golf Tour will now be viewable in the U.S. on the CW network. So that's exciting. That's a big the, deal. Yeah. So I wonder what is going on there. I just saw the tweet. So it's breaking 
but it'll be interesting to see what what the deal is there. Tune in maybe next week and you will probably hear us talk about golf, but we just wanted to mention it once in this to keep the streak alive, which we broke a few weeks ago. Um, On a sports issue, that uh, Paris Saint-Germain, Riyadh All-Star defensive struggle is now in the books. PSG has won 5-4. Probably a very entertaining. I mean, that's nine goals. (laughs) Cristiano Ronaldo got two of them. Messi got one. Uh, Mbappe won. You know, Sergio Ramos won. But uh, I think probably fun was had by all. Yeah, that's that's cool. You know what? That's very that's that'll put butts in seats. I mean, I think I yeah. think that's the very you know if you were an American saying what could you fix about soccer? More goals. We need more <laughs> goals scored. <laughs> A little bit less flopping. Um, and, and, so more and, of these yeah, sort and, of superstar and, matchups. And, and and please, Messi, you know, uh, Ronaldo, Mbappe, and Neymar are all on the same field. Yeah, that's pretty awesome. That is very awesome. <laughs> so it looks like fun was had by all. Um, and Richard, this is cool. We're doing sort of like a live update. I don't know if that's how podcasts work, but uh, <laughs> um, we, don't, we, have, we we do a podcast. We just have no idea how they work in general. Yeah, we don't know how to po- how a podcast work. Yeah, we we <laughs> we're the uh, we're the turn the mic on, make sure it's it's working. Um, kind of kind of folks um back next week richard with a great conversation with jacob mum from bechtel and another full episode thank you very much this was great thank you always a blast always a blast